Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Bradley, and today I just want to do a really short introduction video to solar coronal mass ejections and high altitude nuclear EMPs. Just kind of set the stage for what these are and talk about what threats they pose, and then I'll do some subsequent introductory videos about uh, specifically what kind of preparations you can make to uh, prevent damage from them. So I filled the whiteboard with just a little bit of information. I'll just kind of walk through it, uh, see if we can all get on the same page of what these are. So two distinct threats. One of them is a solar coronal mass ejection. And really what that is, is that's just our sun essentially throwing off some plasma, which is just a charged gas. And that charged plasma comes over and washes over the earth, right? And just kind of washes over the earth. And when it does that, it creates uh, currents that flow in very long conductors. There's this geomagnetic disturbance of our, of our magnetic field lines, and that creates this current that flows in very long conductors. And we'll talk about what that can do here in just a minute. Now, in contrast, um, we have something called an EMP, or electromagnetic pulse. Um, really, when we talk about electromagnetic pulse, we're talking about a nuclear-generated high-altitude EMP. So you start off by launching some missile way up into the atmosphere, typically higher than 300 miles in altitude. So way, way, way up there. You detonate that nuclear warhead. Uh, it creates um, a bunch of high energy particles that then go and ionize atoms. Those ionized atoms perturbate our magnetic field lines of the Earth, and they cause those same kind of currents to flow in conductors. So it's a similar kind of effect you end up with currents in conductors um, from both of these, but, but distinctly different in some ways that I'll talk about. So what do you need to, to uh, create a high altitude nuclear EMP? Well, you really need two things. You've got to have a missile system that can get up that high and that can carry a nuclear warhead. And then you have to have that nuclear warhead itself. And some of them are especially you know, designed to generate more electromagnetic disturbances than others. Um, so it could be optimized to give you even higher uh, field levels down at the surface of the planet. So do these things exist? A lot of people, you know, kind of question, well, if that's even a true, you know, are EMPs real? And they certainly are real. They've demonstrated those for the last, oh, I don't know, about 60 years or so. U.S. military has conducted tests. They've even been used in wartime. Um, so people understand how EMPs work. You detonate this warhead, you're able to generate a disturbance at the ground which can then cause damage to communication systems and other electronics. So they're certainly real now. How would they affect a planet or an entire continent? That's sort of open for debate because it's never happened before. No one's ever detonated one like that. So a lot of simulations have been done and some tests have been done as well to understand what might happen. So, well, let's talk about the specific waveforms that are generated from these two things because it's really important to understand that they're different, all right? A lot of times people talk about EMPs and they think they're one and the same, but they're different things. A solar CME doesn't have any kind of high frequency uh, energy that comes out of it that perturbates to the Earth. It only has something called an E3 or a long duration sort of swelling effect on the energy in these conductors. Think of it kind of like a C coming in and rising the levels, the voltage levels on those long conductors. And so it might take hours for that energy to fully rise. So this is not a quick, you know, over in a millisecond kind of thing. This is a slow energy build on very long conductors. Unlike that, an EMP has three distinct phases to it. It has a very brief phase. When the detonation first occurs, it causes a very brief but extremely strong high voltage pulse felt at the surface of the Earth. It might only last about 20 nanoseconds, so that's extremely small in terms of time, but it might reach 50,000 volts per meter or more, which is much higher than we would normally ever see, and that very high electric field can cause damage to all sorts of things. It also Right after E1, there's an E2 event, which is some kind of a brief pulse that's around the same kind of timing as like a lightning strike. A nearby lightning strike might be, you know, remember if a lightning strikes nearby, sometimes you'll get kind of a flicker on the lights, maybe your TV will wave, that kind of thing. That's the electromagnetic energy coupling into conductors and then causing some disturbance. So it creates something like that as well, following the E1. And then after that, it creates an E3, which is very similar to the solar CME, where it's this long duration swell. The only difference is it really doesn't last as long. It might be in the order of a few minutes where this swell starts to occur on very long conductors. So of the two, if you think about it, this one is a superset of this one. It has not only the E3, but E1 and E2 also. So in that regard, you could think of it as being um, more dangerous, more, more difficult to protect from because there's different things, different aspects to it. Now, 
what's the difference of having one type of waveform versus three? Well, the primary difference is E1 and E2 can couple into smaller length conductors, right? So things like your cell phone or things like your car, anything, you know, even relatively small scale electronics, that energy can couple onto those traces, flow to the electronics, cause some damage to them. So it couples to both short and long conductors, all right? Long conductors could be power lines or telephone lines. Short conductors could be the tiniest trace on your circuit board uh, in some kind of electronics. And because of that, it can affect both small and large scale systems, power grids all the way down to maybe a digital watch or something like that, okay? Very broad spectrum of things it can affect. Its risk then is really across the gamut. It can be, can cause damage to your car, it could cause damage to the power line, it could take out telecommunication systems, all kinds of stuff can happen from this. So that's why the nuclear EMP is so worrisome is it can cause damage to so many different things. Now the CME only had this E3, so it can only couple into very long conductors. Now when I say very long, I don't mean like the harnesses in your car. I mean things that are miles long, okay? So a CME won't affect anything that doesn't have conductors attached to it that aren't miles long, all right? So that's one way to kind of sort it out. But anything attached to the power grid fits right in that, right? Because it's attached to the power grid and that power grid is miles long, so you can couple that energy in there and potentially that energy flows downstream and causes damage to anything connected to it. All right, so the biggest risk from the CME is to the power grid. Whereas again, the biggest risk from an EMP could be the power grid or your car or electronics and it's freestanding electronics of any sort. All right, so different in terms of the scope of what they can affect. So people often ask these two questions. Well, which of these is more dangerous? Well, on the surface, one would say the EMP is the more dangerous of the two because it has all of these different effects, right? It can affect small things and large things. It can cause damage to your car and you know, your radios and anything else freestanding as well. Whereas the CME really only damages things connected to those really, really long conductors. All right, so which of them is more likely? Well, that one, without a doubt, you could point to the CME, all right? This uh, coronal mass ejection is going to occur, all right? No question about it, we have them all the time. The sun throws off these plasma bursts and they, some of them come in the direction of the earth and they cause damage, all right? The stronger that plasma burst that comes over, the more damage potentially it could cause. So it's certainly, a, there's no doubt about it that a solar CME is going to occur, whereas you could argue that an EMP may never occur. No one may ever actually detonate a warhead high in the atmosphere and try and cause EMP damage to a country. Now, others though might contest that argument. The, a really big CME only happens about once every 150 years or so. Now, we are slightly past due for a big CME to hit the Earth. The last one was the Carrington event, which was like in 1863 or so. And that's a little more than 150 years ago, so indeed we're a little past due for one. So it could occur at any day, or it could be another 100 years from now before it happens. But it is going to happen. We will get a big CME that will cause disturbances and probably a lot of damage to our power system. An EMP, on the other hand, could happen tomorrow, right? We'd have no idea if China or Russia or some other nuclear-capable country might decide to try and attack the United States in that way. And there's lots of reasons, lots of benefits to doing it this way. You don't cause widespread damage where people you know, are immediately dying from nuclear radiation or anything like that. So people may feel like it's a more viable type attack to attack infrastructures using an EMP. So this one's a little bit, little bit harder to fully argue the case. Yes, this will always occur, but given our current geopolitical climate and all of the, the tensions around the world, others might argue that an EMP is all but a certainty uh, in the near term. All right, so all of this I really just put together to give you a very high level, brief introduction to a high altitude nuclear EMP versus a solar coronal mass ejection, all right? I'm gonna try and do a series of videos where I compare them, I talk about the preparations, important things you can do to protect your property and your family from these types of threats. Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Bradley, and I'll be your host here at the EMP Doctor YouTube channel where we'll talk about EMP attacks and how to protect yourself from them. If you're interested, don't forget to hit the subscribe button.